when all the good boys are joined gang. Coming to Jesus House Dallas this summer. 4440 Spring Valley Road, Farmers Branch, Texas, 75244. Bad guy. Sorry, that was the wrong glasses. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know why I keep making the same mistake. The same thing happened in the first service. <laughs> Amen. Your pastor hasn't joined Bad Gang. Bro. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's hot in Texas. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This morning when I was getting dressed, my wife said I look like a gangster. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Can we rise to our feet really quick and just um, uh, speak some words of life into our lives? At the count of three, one, two, and three. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am like a tree planted by rivers of water, and I bear fruit in due season. When the sun shines, my leaves will not wither. Well, in secret place of the Most High, and I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. No evil shall befall me, and no sickness shall come near my dwelling. I am surrounded with favor like a shield. I am the works of my hand are blessed. I am blessed at work, and I am blessed at home. No enchantment against me, and no divination will find me. The Lord is my portion. Excellent health is my portion. Progress is my portion. Promotion is my portion. This is my portion. Joy is my portion. And peace is my portion. This land is my inheritance because I am a son of Abraham. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. No, no, don't sit down yet. Calm down. Calm down. Turn to your neighbor and repeat after me. Please look your neighbor in the eye as you say this. Amen. Is that too hard? Okay, turn to somebody. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. And give thee peace. Amen. You may please be seated. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. How many people are excited to be here this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Even, even, even better, how many people are happy to be alive this morning? If you're glad you're alive this morning, shout Hallelujah. <laughs> if you're not happy to be alive, then... Amen. God will give you joy. Amen. You know, one of the things that I really love about, about Texas is, is Dallas in the summer. Amen? Amen. I, 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 don't, don't get me wrong. I know the heat is excruciating. You know, some people say that the heat in, in, in Dallas is like a rehearsal for hell. <laughs> but, but you know what? There, there is just a, a lightness in the air. You know, a, a sense of carefreeness. That is just, it's just lovely. It almost feels like you should be, that all you should be doing is eating frozen custard from Andes and, and, and lounging, lounging by the pool. Yeah? Doesn't, that, doesn't it feel like that? You know, just taking it easy. Yeah? You know, my wife and I took a break. I was, I, 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 we did a staycation. Uh, staycation, yeah, you stay at home. <laughs> for, for two weeks. And it wasn't bad because, now the reason why we did the staycation was because, you know, we've got a daughter going off to college in the fall and you, you know how that can be. Yeah. You know, so the uh, resources are a little bit more uh, focused, amen? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. So we have to do a staycation. And the good thing about a staycation is you're not worrying about hotel bills. You know, you don't have to, you know, revise your budget every time you want to drink a bottle of Coke. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So we did a staycation and it was, we had a blast. Because all we did was eat ice cream, <laughs> you know, eat ice cream in the evenings, in the morning, go out to brunch, and it was really nice. But the problem is I had to come back to work, and that's the problem with summer. You actually have to work in summer. You know, summer actually feels like you should not be working. Yes. Does anybody agree with me? 
Amen. Amen. Alas, children have to go to college. So you have to get back to work. But you know, another thing that I really love about summer is the, 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 are, are the movies. Going to the, 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 the movie theater. You know, they've got these big budget blockbuster movies that come out in the summer. I don't know how many people remember when Independence Day came out. I mean, those movies are, they are massive. And you go to Cinemark with the XD screen. Oh, my God. For me, that's just summer. Yeah? Popcorn, big drink, as you can see, the mountain, <laughs> or the molehill became a mountain. But that is summer. You know, movies that are not deep, but things blow up a lot. No plot, just explosions, boom, 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 and I'm happy. You know, people are fighting, people are getting killed. You know those movies where you get in and in five minutes, ten people have died? You know, in five minutes, ten houses have blown up. That's summer. All that deep stuff, leave it for winter. All the, all the, you know those kind of movies that you just be thinking? Like Inception. Anybody here ever watch Inception? By the time I was done with that movie, I had a headache. <laughs> Thank God they don't do that in the summer. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. So what we have tried to do as a church is that every summer we try to harness that sense of fun and lightheartedness. Amen? Amen. Through our JHD Max uh, uh, sermon series. So I'll show up on stage dressed in all black and you know, wear sunshades. It's just, you know, to keep it lighthearted. Amen? Amen. We, we, we try to theme the sermons after popular movies or, or popular songs. But, but we always maintain the depth and the spirituality that is in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So this summer, we're kicking off our, our JHD Max series with a, with a sermon we have titled Bad Gang. Amen. Bad Gang is the title of a popular song made famous by a certain grammatically and phonetically challenged uh, uh, artist that is familiar to some of us here. And the song basically talks about how all the young folks are, are all joining bad gangs in the sense that they are adopting uniformly unwholesome behavior and attitudes. Now, the key thing to remember when we're talking about gangs good or bad, is the uniformity, the visible and invisible similarities that unite the members of the gang. Amen? Amen? And usually, there is a visible identifier in the gangs that we are familiar with, like the colors that they would wear. You know, in, in, in South Central LA, they had a couple of gangs that some of us may have heard of called the Bloods and the Crips. And the way you recognize the Bloods were they always wore red. Yeah? And the way you recognize the Crips was that they always wore blue, yeah? They had little signs that they would flash to each other to, to say that, you know, I'm a member of the gang. They had places where they hung out. But they were in constant conflict. When you see them, you would know them, but they were in constant conflict. But the truth is this. You may not be a member of the Blood or the Crips, but everybody belongs to one gang or the other. And the question that I want to ask you this morning as we start this sermon series is what gang do you belong to? The Bible tells us that there are only two gangs, one evil and one good, darkness and light. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter and the 14th verse, it says, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What do they have in common? What does righteousness and wickedness, what do they have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? None. They have no business with each other. They are in constant conflict, constant opposition to each other. The problem with these two gangs, the gang of darkness and the gang of light, is that unlike the bloods and the crypts, you can't identify them by the colors that they wear. You can't identify the members by the uniform that they wear. Some churches have uniforms, but you see, those uniforms are not really indicative of the membership of the members of that church. Because there are churches that are full of bad gang. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that the devil, the chief of the gang of darkness, 
will sometimes appear as an angel of light. That means that sometimes the devil will don the costume of an angel. And when you see him, he will look like an angel. The Bible talks about wolves that wear sheep clothing. So you, it would be a mistake if you were to judge a person's membership in or, 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 or a membership of a gang by the color of what they are wearing. So the question is, how do you know which gang you belong to? I, note, I didn't say, how do you know which gang your neighbor belongs to? So if you're listening to this sermon and say, oh, I wish my brother was here. <laughs> it sounds like this is what he needs. Tell your neighbor he's talking about me. <laughs> the Bible says in the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, and the 16th through to the 18th verse, it says, by their fruit, you will what? recognize them. Hallelujah. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? Or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears what? Bad fruit. bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. You can tell what gang you belong to. Not by the color or the clothes. Or the sign that you make with your hands. But by the way that you behave. Not by the decals that you stick on your car but by the way that you behave. We can tell what gang you belong to by the choices that you make, the things that you say. We can tell, and you can tell, what group you belong to by the way that you live your life. Your fruits speak much louder and more truthfully than your words. You know, one of the things that we teach folks in premarital counseling is that in communication with other people, our words make up only a small percentage of what the person we are communicating with receives. When you're communicating with somebody, your words, your verbal communication makes up only 7% of what they receive from you. It's a fraction, a tiny fraction, less than 10% of what I hear are your words. Your actions... Your non-verbal communication makes up 93%. Your body language, your tone, your gestures. Your actions speak louder than your words. That is why when you're talking to somebody, particularly those of us in relationships, you're talking to somebody, you're talking and you're talking, but they keep hearing something else. And you keep saying, that's not what I said. It is true, that's not what you said with your mouth. But that is what you said with your body. All right. You're telling somebody you love them, but you're tapping your feet. I love you. <laughs> no, 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 I really love you. <laughs> and the person is crying, and you're wondering why they're crying. Didn't I just say I love you? No, what you said is since you are disturbing me, and you feel so strongly about it, I am going to say these three words to you, I don't really mean them, but it will get you off my back. Our actions are a more reliable metric to judge what is in our hearts. That is why the Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know them. If you want to know what gang you belong to, you need to examine your fruits. In fact, the Bible tells us, examine yourself. Turn to your neighbor and say, examine yourself. examine yourself. To examine yourself means to question yourself. It means to ask yourself, why do you behave the way that you behave? Why do you make the choices that you make? You know, many of us don't do any self-examination until we have problems. We don't question our decisions until we get into trouble. And by then, it's already too late because you're already in trouble. We accept ourselves wholesale. Say, you know, this is who I am. I have a temper. Why do you have a temper? Do you know that many people that have a temper, at the root of their temper is low self-esteem. At the root of their temper is a deep insecurity about themselves. Some people, it's not insecurity, it's just pride. 
They have an exaggerated opinion of themselves. But you will never find out what is at the root of your problems if you don't examine yourself. And if you don't examine yourself, you will not fix the things that need to be fixed. Some people can't keep their mouth closed. They just keep talking. You say, I just like to talk. Why? Why? Tell your neighbor he's talking to me. <laughs> examine yourself. And when you examine yourself, what do you see? And please let me be clear. When I talk about examining yourself, I'm not talking about examining yourself and comparing yourself with your neighbor. The Bible says we don't compare ourselves with ourselves. We examine ourselves in the light of God's word. Because you see, when you compare yourself with your neighbor, you will always look good. Can I tell you why? Because you will always cherry pick the worst thing about your neighbor. All right. Say, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I, I, you know, couples do that a lot. Thanks, couples are, are phenomenal. Say, Pastor, I know I have problems. <laughs> Pastor, I know that. I, you know, Pastor, it's true. No, no, no. Pastor, I won't argue with you. I, I agree. I have, you know, I, I can be a little. Pastor, I know. I, I, I accept my own. But my wife. <laughs> Our sins are always better than the other person. That's why the Bible says you don't compare yourself with your neighbor. You compare yourself with Christ. You examine yourself not in light of what society says is acceptable. Not in light of what is culturally Acceptable, but in light of what does the word of God say? Amen? Amen? There will always be somebody who drinks more than you. That doesn't make your drinking okay. Say, Pastor, I only have one side chick. <laughs> only one. Pastor, my friend has five. <laughs> Examine yourself. In light of God's word. And when you examine yourself, what do you see? If you see the following, you will know that you are in the bad gang. Or you have joined the bad gang. Galatians, the fifth chapter and the 19th verse says. Galatians 5, 19 through to 21 says. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. Touch anybody say sexual immorality. Impurity. impurity. Touch your name and say impurity. impurity. And debauchery. Idolatry. Idolatry. Some of us don't know what debauchery is. <laughs> debauchery is just general, excessively bad consumption. Idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Tell your other neighbor, hatred. I don't see anybody pointing. Point to them. Hatred. Wag your finger. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. Envy. Drunkenness. Wave your two hands at your neighbor. Drunkenness. Orgies and the like. It says, I warn you. <laughs> Who are you warning? <laughs> listen, listen. Warn yourself. <laughs> Say, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this, how are you living? says that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We are not reading Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers. This is not the Old Testament. This is Galatians. It doesn't get more New Testament than this. So all you New Testament Christians who think that the New Testament is licensed to licentiousness, you've missed it. The Bible says those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
You know, there's a message of grace. Hyper grace, grace on steroids, super grace, that says it is okay to live and do anything you like. Live anyhow you like. See, if we are in the New Testament, I, I am under the new covenant. So it doesn't matter what I do. So sexual immorality is okay. I am married, but I have a side piece. I'm under the new covenant. Don't disturb me. I am not married, but I'm under the new covenant. So it's okay. Don't disturb me. Everybody is doing it. Drunkenness. Pastor, what is wrong with being drunk? Even the Bible says a little wine for the stomach's sake. Are you deaf? A little. If you drink a little wine, you cannot be drunk. And if you drink a little and you are drunk, you drank too much. And this is one of the areas where a lot of young people get lost. A lot of young people get lost. And confused about what the Bible says. True. True. There is nowhere in the Bible that says you should not drink wine. But I can show you places in the Bible that says you should not get drunk. Let me show you some. Just to clarify. Isaiah 5 verse 22. Please pull it up so that they won't think I'm just saying it. It says, whoa. You know what woe means? Woe means calamity. When the people say woe, they put their hands on their heads. They say, whoa. It says, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. And champions hmm, at mixing drinks. Say, pastor, when I mix this thing, eh? Bible say woe to you. <laughs> say, Pastor, if I balance, just give me one. Hennessy. Bible says woe. Let me read you some more. Proverbs 23, 21. It says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to what? Poverty. That means that at the end of that road is poverty. And please, let's, not, let's be clear. Poverty is not always the absence of money. You can be, have money and be poor. No relationships. Your spirit is, is poor. You are alone. And that's what happens to drunkards. They end up impoverished, either financially or relationally. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 10. If that's not enough, let me show you one more. It says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Tell your neighbor, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral. We have become so accepting of immorality. So accepting, so comfortable with immorality. Because we're trying to adapt to our society. He says, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Listen to me. I don't care what the law says. The Bible says men who have sex with men and women who have sex with women. The Bible compares them to thieves, to greedy, to drunkards, to slanderers, to swindlers. And I know we have a problem with it. Because, you know, we know some people who do that. And it's like, hey, who are they hurting? You see, that is because we've started to adopt the ways of the world, not the ways of God. Listen, the word of God does not change with the times. It is constant. If we are following a God that changes with the times, he's not worth following. If your God changes when, the, when you are in Africa, he's a different God than your God in America. Please, you are wasting your time with that God. 
If your God changes depending on who you are talking to, depending on the organizational policies of your office, you're wasting your time. That's not a God. He's not worth following. The Bible says he's the rock of ages. He's the ancient of days. He's the one who was, who is, and who will be. The Bible says he does not change. If homosexuality was a problem 20,000 years ago, it would be a problem 20,000 years from now. You cannot be so educated and so exposed that your education and your exposure nullifies the word of God. The Bible says the people that practice these things, let me read them to you again. Sexual immorality, idolatry. And by the way, I hope you know idolatry is not that you have only to statue in your backyard that you go and and worship. That is low-level idolatry. That is ignorant idolatry. How do you worship something that you made? That doesn't make any sense to me. The idolatry that many of us are guilty of is when we exalt certain things above God. And for some of us, what we exalt above God is money. Money. For some of us, it is our bodies. And the reason or the way that you know you've exalted something above God is when you will do that thing and you will follow that thing in spite of what God says. So if you will chase money, even though God has said chase him, who is your God? Your God is what determines the choices you make. And it doesn't matter. Your God could be your child. Your God could be your marriage. Some of us will do anything for our marriage. Say, ah, my husband. (laughs) I can't repeat what they're saying. The Bible says the people that practice these things Adultery. Let me tell you what adultery is. Sleeping with somebody when you are married. That is adultery. Somebody who you are not married to when you are married. Amen? The Bible says the people that do these things, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers, says the people that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what is this kingdom of God that we're in danger of losing? Romans 14 verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It says you are in danger of losing the righteousness that comes from being in right standing with God. The righteousness that comes by faith, you will lose it if you practice these things. Because what we forget is that everything that we have, even our faith, God gave it to us. It says you are in danger of losing the peace that comes from not being considered an enemy of God because you will become an enemy of God. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. That means that God becomes your problem. And and, and pride is simply thinking that you know better than God. It says you're in danger of losing the joy that comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is a relationship with God. And what the Bible is telling us that if you practice these things, listen, one of the things that happens in church is that we think that church people should be perfect. Yeah, so we come to church and we're looking at Pastor, do you know that this person does this? Pastor, do you know that this person does that? And we compare ourselves with them. That ah, If Pastor Femi can do it, so it's okay for me to do it. When you get to the pearly gates, try that excuse. <laughs> try it. Seriously. Because they will tell you. Why do you have a Bible? It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. See, church is a hospital. It's not a spa. But that is not license for the folks in church. They say, no, 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 no. Pastor Femi said, he said, hospital. So, so please, let me remain sick. The problem with remaining sick is that, let me tell you something, eventually you die. So don't be content with being an adulterer. Say, Pastor, I'm sick. (laughs) 
Look in the mirror, what do you see? Sexual immorality, drunkenness, envy, rage, idolatry. You've joined bad gang. But there is a good gang, my brothers and sisters. And the members of that gang are also recognizable by their fruits. Let me show you their fruits. The Bible says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. When you examine yourself, do you see love? You see, the main identifier of whether you are in the good gang or the bad gang is love. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits, but the fruit, singular, is love. And love manifesting through joy and peace because of our relationship with God. And love manifesting as patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control towards the people that we meet. And if you pay close attention... The person that is walking in kindness and goodness cannot, cannot be committing adultery. Because adultery hurts people. It hurts your wife. It hurts your father or your your husband. Somebody said yes. (laughs) It does. Men hurt too. Amen? It hurts your family. It hurts your kids. The person that is practicing fornication And I use that word fornication intentionally because we don't say fornication anymore. We have sanitized it. Say premarital sex. We say just, you know, casual dalliances. (laughs) Casual sex. Is that serious sex? (laughs) Say say casual sex. You know, just, Pastor, we just hooked up. You fornicated. Tell your neighbor, fornication is fornication. Fornication fornication. If you put lipstick on a pig, if you put Armani on a pig, pig. fornication is what? Thank you. I'm going to stop saying premarital sex. Because premarital sex kind of, it just makes it kind of like, okay, since we're getting married, it is really not that bad. If you are not married, it's fornication. Tell your neighbor, if you're not married, don't be afraid. They can't punch you. We're in church. (laughs) Oh, my Jesus. The Bible says, listen, you cannot be walking in love and be fornicating. Because when you do that, the Bible says you sin against yourself. Amen? But if you love someone, why would you encourage them? Or facilitate their self-destruction. If you have self-control, why would you drink to the point where you're going to get a DUI? I want us to note that the Bible does not say, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is cars, houses, designer clothes, designer shoes. It doesn't say the fruit of the Holy Spirit is marriage. And twins. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is double double. That's all the Bible says. Where did double double come from? Oh, no, it's that prophet. He said he wants a double portion of the anointing. Okay. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is not a promotion, it's not a fat bank account. It is love. And I say this because there are many folks who assess their standing in the kingdom by the abundance or the lack of these material things. Even though the Bible clearly states in Luke 12, 15, it says, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The abundance of your possessions may mean that you're a part of of the 2%, but it does not mean you are a member of God's gang. John 13, 36 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. 1335, sorry. If you have love one to another. Examine yourself and what do you see? It matters because what you see and what you do about what you see determines whether you will inherit the kingdom of God or not. 
If you are honest with yourself and what you see are the works of the flesh, then this morning you need to ask God to help you. The Bible says in Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ, those who are a member of God's gang, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Listen to me, the new covenant does not cancel the requirement for holiness. Hallelujah. It doesn't cancel it. Adultery is not okay under the old covenant or the new covenant. Drunkenness is not okay under the old covenant or the new covenant. Debauchery is not okay under the new or the old covenant. Neither is idolatry. Sin doesn't change because we're under the new covenant. But our ability to not sin is what changes. Jesus Christ gives us the power to resist temptation. Separate from willpower. But you know what? Many of us are not even trying to access the power of Jesus anymore. We're not even trying to, to say, God, help me anymore because somebody has told us it's okay. So we don't pray that, God, you know, I'm struggling with my temper. We don't pray like that anymore. We don't pray that, God, I am looking at people I should not be looking at because we think it's okay. It's not okay. It's still not okay. It never was. What has changed is that now we can go to Christ and say, help me. So if you hear a message that says, yeah, it's okay. That message is a lie from the pit of hell. Because it is designed to lull you into complacency. And to take from you the kingdom of God. You see, your fruits describe who you are. More than whatever label you give yourself. And at a certain point, Christianity is just a label. And there are many who call themselves Christians. I know my time is up. I, I, was, I was on time in the first service. <laughs> a lot of people call themselves Christians. But you know, Christianity is just a label. It's not a fruit. The Bible doesn't say, by your label we shall know you. It's by your fruit that we shall know you. And the way we cultivate that fruit is that we, we, we daily abide. The Bible says, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. Amen. You have to abide. We have to cultivate that relationship because everything stems out of that relationship. When I see somebody who calls themselves a Christian doing stupid things, and these days it's easy to see with social media. I don't know why people feel they need to post all their, all their nonsense. I mean, if you kept it to yourself, nobody would know. But you have the effrontery to post this thing, so we know. When I see those things, do you know what I see? I see somebody who does not have a relationship with God. Because the ability to live righteously stems from that relationship. It is that relationship that, 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 that resources you, that flows, that, that releases power into you. And when you don't have that relationship, we see the fruit of it. That is why daily I cling to Christ. I, I don't play with my Christianity because that is the source of everything that I am. Not just everything that I have, but everything that I am. The husband that I am, the father that I am, the brother that I am, the son that I am, the pastor that I am, the friend that I am. It all comes out of that relationship. If there's anything good in me, it comes from that relationship. And the absence of that relationship, all that is left is Femi. And many of you will not like Femi. That relationship is critical. It is critical. And that is why in this church, because, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't preach that relationship in one sermon or two sermons or three sermons. There are tools that you need because it is not instinctive. It is not a natural flow. You have to be intentional. Friendship is not a natural flow. It's intentional. You can connect with somebody Meet them the first time and you guys strike it off. You hit it off. But for that relationship to blossom and become a thing, people have to be intentional. And it's the same thing with our Christianity. We have to be intentional. So what we did as a church is because everybody is at different levels. We, we set up a class. We called it the spiritual maturity class. And the reason why we have that class is it's not because 
I need the class. I already know what is in the class. It is so that I can give you, through that class, I can train you and give you the tools that you need, that you were not born with. It doesn't fall on you. The tools don't fall on you. Somebody has to teach them to you. And you've never learned them. You're going to always struggle in your relationship with God. And that's why many of us are struggling with that relationship. Let me help you. Attend the class. If your relationship with God, and, and you know, the Bible says, by their fruits we shall know them. Every day we're telling God, I want to be closer to you. All of us are waiting to go home and watch Game of Thrones. Let this man hurry up so that he will not make mistake and I will miss and create a domino effect that will make me miss my Game of Thrones. Invest in your spiritual development. Invest in your relationship with Christ. Sign up for the spiritual maturity class. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. All of us at some point should have learned, picked up the tools that we need. Amen? Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. The service managers need to learn about patience and kindness. <laughs> Alex, Alex is, is sweating under that jacket like, what's this man doing? No, I will pray for you after the service. <laughs> Let us speak to the Lord this morning. Examine yourself and speak to the Lord. What gang do you belong to? Some of us are really good with the obvious sins. We don't do sexual immorality don't drink any wine but there's hatred in our hearts some of us have been bragging for the last 20 years that pastor I don't have a temper God has delivered me from my temper but that is all he has delivered you from you don't get angry anymore and you're resting on that that was he delivered you 15 years ago what else what other fruits do we have to show Let's ask God to help us, my brothers and sisters. Let's ask God to help us. That we may live a life that is worthy of his name. That we may not lose our inheritance. Father, we bless you. We give you praise and we give you glory. For those of us who, are, who cannot even call ourselves members of God's gang, it's a very simple process. There's no initiation fee. It's just a prayer that says, Father, I accept that Jesus died for me. I accept that his blood was shed for me. I accept that his sacrifice paid for my sins. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for saving me. That's all you need to do, my brothers and sisters. And those of us who are already members of God's gang, it is time for us to walk a walk that is pleasing in his sight. The Bible says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I behaved like a child. Now that I'm an adult, I need to put away childish things. Father, I thank you for all your children here this morning. As a father, you will bless them that you'll cause your face to shine upon them, that you lift up your countenance over them, be gracious to them, and grant them your peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.